All right, let's go to our Bibles and go to John chapter 10. I'm going to read uh, one verse from John chapter 10, because that's really what we're, we, we want to talk about tonight. Jesus makes a statement here, and sometimes we, we look at it, and okay, we understand what he's saying, but what does he mean? Um, John chapter 10 and verse number 10. Most of the verse we understand, because he's talking about a thief. He says, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, let me stop there. Uh, what, he, what he's saying leading up to this, he's saying the people before me, not, not God's prophets, but there are a lot of people who come, quote unquote, in the name of Christ or in the name of God, uh, and they are not sent by God. So he says, let's, let's read it, and then we'll get back to verse number 10. Look at verse number 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and I shall go in and out and find pasture. Okay, that's why he's talking about a thief. The thief doesn't have any good to do. He's a thief. And so he says, that's why they came. And then the middle of verse number 10, he says, I, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, yes, he came so that we can have eternal life. Uh, he didn't come when he, when he came to die on the cross for us. He didn't come so we could have physical life. We already have physical life. God just put that in us, and people reproduce, and we have physical life. So Jesus, when he came, came to bring eternal life, came to bring life after death for us because um, the wages of sin, because we're sinners, we should die. So he didn't, they, God didn't want that for us, so he made the way. But he goes on, and we want to look at what he says about have it more abundantly. Abundant life. What is abundant life? Well, uh, the Bible doesn't talk about it, except, I mean, talk about abundant life in those words. But as you study Scripture, you see that God wants us to have joy. God wants us to be joyful. And many times you, you see people, and it, it's, it's a kind of a sad thing to see Christians uh, and and my wife, I, it's not even her. It's it's what I recognize about myself. Uh, my facial expressions just don't. If I just don't smile, I look like I'm frowning. And uh, and and so if if people were just staring at me and I looked at them without without smiling at them, they would think I was angry. And that's just the way it way it is. So I got to try to pull up my the corners of my mouth. And, <laughs> look like I'm not not frowning but uh, we should have joy and of course we can be joyful and still have troubles and frown once in a while but overall God wants us to be filled with joy so we want to look at this joy-filled life tonight and we can be joyful because of what Jesus has done so our life should be a spiritual life filled or from Jesus Christ People can't, cannot have an abundant life without having Christ at the center. We can, have, we, we can have eternal life because we put our faith in Christ, and we can have that, that confidence that after we die, we'll go to be living with Christ. But we don't always have abundant life. We don't always have a joy-filled life. We talked about discouragements of the morning, and they were kind of related in this way, but it's not. It, it's, I'm not going to deal with that kind of thing. But in our lives, we, we have to have Jesus at the center. We can't be joy-filled without keeping our heart close to Jesus. Go over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse number 11.
Jesus is speaking, and he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Now, we're talking about the fullness of joy here. We're talking about a joy-filled life. But what did he just finish talking to us about? I'm not going to read the whole passage, but if you look at it, he's talking about abiding in him. We can, we can, uh, we can be Christians, but we can be in a, in a sense. Now, I've got to be careful here because I want you to, I want you to picture. So I'm going to give you a, an example uh, in, in physical, the physical realm of what I'm talking about. Uh, we can be disconnected from Christ, even though we're, we're saved. When, when, so when I say disconnected or not attached to Christ, I'm, I'm not talking about he's not part of our life. Once we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. We're born again, and we are God's children. Uh, we are uh, brothers to Christ. Uh, we are adopted into the family of God, and that will never change. But we can stand back. And I gave an, an example this morning about, and I'm not, this is a different example, but I gave it like we walk away or we drive down the road and we don't even have Jesus in our, our uh, passenger seat or the back seat. We put him in a trailer at the back and pull him along with us. And that's not the way we should live life. We should have Jesus at the center. He's not even supposed to be in the passenger seat. We are supposed to be the passenger He's driving for us. Uh, you've seen those bumper stickers, God is my co-pilot. I don't want him my co-pilot. I want him my pilot. Okay? He's better at it than a co-pilot would be. Uh, so tr life comes from Jesus Christ. Number one, we've got to have Jesus Christ uh, in our life. We have to be saved in order to have an abundant life. And that's what he said. I came for that reason. Um Being connected to Christ, being abiding in Him, is like uh, having a battery in your car. How many of you have um, automobiles? All right. Do you need to get out in the morning and just start it up? Do you have a battery in there? Usually we do. I'm not talking about electric vehicles. I'm talking about a regular gas vehicle. You have a battery. That battery is in your car, and if it starts the car... It's, it's going to run for a while if you don't have an alternator. Okay? Does everybody know what an alternator is? Mm. The alternator charges the battery. The car will run on battery power. It's connected, but if you're not consistently charging the battery as you drive that car, your car is going to run down and stop. Our lives are going to run for a while... Because we know Jesus Christ, but if we're not abiding in him, we go on our own steam for a while. And then we run down. We fail. And so God, Christ says, I want you to have an abundant life. And as long as we are consistently looking to him, getting to know him through scripture, then our lives will be filled with joy. Because Jesus, and you know Jesus never had anything but joy in his life. He had trials and heartaches, but he never lost his joy. Look at um, go, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. And look at verse number, well, start at verse number 8. Now, this is, Paul's talking about himself and, and the people he's with as he's uh, ministering for Christ on these mission trips. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 
So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I'm going to go back to verse number 16, but look at verse 18. He says, we are to look at the things that are not seen, the things that have to do with spiritual activity, God's instructions, God's guidance. If we think, if we look at just the physical, he says the physical things, the things that are seen, are temporal. That means they're going to end at some time. But the spiritual things are forever. They last forever. Now go back to verse number 16. He says, For which cause we faint not, because we want, uh, verse number 15 is saying, uh, uh, all things we do are for your sakes, uh, that the abundant grace might redound to the glory of God. I skipped a bunch of words there because that's what he's saying, that the abundant grace, we will see God working. And that's what we want. So for that reason, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The inward man is that new nature that he's talking about, he's dealing with. When we put our faith in Christ, we are new creatures, new people, and we begin living a different kind of life. And so he says, um, this inward man is to grow daily. He says the inward man is renewed day by day. We know, and I think all of us know, that this outward man, this physical body, is going to die one day. But the inward man will never die. It's like every day, it's a brand new person, renewed day by day. Look at Galatians chapter 2. We can recognize these things. We can recognize that. God has done this for us, and since He has done this, we are renewed day by day. It's a spiritual birth, a spiritual man. We have new a new nature. This should be something that we should be joyful about. We are <clears throat> if the life, if our life was just physical, you think about animals. We had a chicken die last Sunday. Or Jerry had a chicken die last Sunday. And you think about it, and it, it wasn't a fun thing to know that chicken died, but it's just a chicken. It's just an animal. And for animals, they just die. That's it. And they don't, they don't resurrect any time. Uh, I know people argue with me but, about that, but they're not going to come back. Okay? Uh, we are human beings made in the image of God, so we can be joyful that even though I die, I will live forever when Christ returns. Now look at what, what Paul says. Look at verse number 20 of Galatians 2. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So what does he mean by I am crucified with Christ? My sins. I, this being, this person who was just uh, uh, like an animal without uh, God's new spirit coming into me, I recognized that Jesus died for my sins. And so I recognized that his, my sins were on him, so I died with him. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I. Now he's saying something different. I'm, I'm not the one who's living. He says, Christ liveth in me. 
and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live uh, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, I live now, we should live now, uh, knowing that Christ is living through us. We are Christ, and this might sound funny, but we are Christ to the world. We should be living a life that they see Christ in. And when we do, when we live that kind of life, that joy that God wants us to have will be an abundant joy. It will be a joy-filled life. He talks about, uh, God talks about abundance or the, uh, the fullness of joy. The fullness of joy means it's, it's a mature joy. It's a joy that, that it has grown to understand the truth of living a life uh, full of Jesus, Jesus Christ. So our abundant life will be a spiritual life uh, through Jesus Christ. Our abundant life also, Paul talks about it here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, it'll be a life that is shared with others. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And look at uh, verse number 12. He says, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. What's he saying? He's saying, but what I'm doing for you, death works in me. I mean, I, every day it, uh, Paul was under uh, um, pressure from the world, even from the Jewish people he used to live with. And uh, he, was, he was almost put to death several times. A lot of things, and we'll, we'll look at it a little bit, what he says about this. But he says, death worketh in us. It's close. Death is close to us. But the reason it's close is because I'm living this life for you. He says, life in you. Look down at verse 15. He says, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. So all things, the things that Paul was going through was for other people. He wasn't, he wasn't out to, to make a name for himself. He didn't go from town to town so that he got points. So God could say, yeah, marking off the points, say, okay, make these little hash marks. And okay, you got five today. Let's go on to the next day and get more. No, God wasn't making points. Paul wasn't making points. Paul was looking ahead. He was looking, these people, these people in this town need Jesus Christ. You remember Cornelius? Cornelius was a, a man in, in the city of Caesarea on the coast of uh, Israel, and he believed in God. He worshipped God, but he, he was not a Jew, but he worshipped God. The only problem with Cornelius was he didn't know the full truth. He had never heard of Jesus Christ. And so God uh, got him to send for Simon Peter, and Peter came up and gave him the full truth of Jesus Christ. And uh, this, is the, this is what Paul wanted to do in the cities where he went. He wanted people to know Jesus Christ. Our lives are going to be full of joy. We will have a more abundant life as we look around and say, you know, to ourselves, I shouldn't be as selfish as I am. Now, I'm not saying people are selfish here, but, you know, we are. Uh, we are self-centered many times. We are um, absorbed with ourself. And um, it's wrong for us to be self-centered. Now, what God does, he has done for us. Now, you can look at it this way. Well, if God... You're, you're not supposed to look at it this way. God did all of these things for me. Why don't I just do things for me? No, his, he's the example that he did for others. Jesus came that we might have what? Life. We have the truth. Paul had the truth and he gave the truth to the people. Peter had the truth and he preached to Cornelius and many in his family got saved. We have the truth. We know the truth. 
and we are to share it with others. We, Jesus needs to be in our life, and then we are to share him with others. How much can you share Jesus Christ with others and then finally not have enough to share later? <laughs> He's infinite. He can go around to all people all over the world. And so we are to give of ourselves. As we give of ourselves, we are giving Jesus Christ. People look at Christianity and uh, uh, people in the world, and it, it, it kind of scares them. And I think they get scared because what they have learned or what they have, have believed is that Christianity is a bunch of don'ts. Don't do this and don't do that. Well, I don't want to put myself in a box and not be able to do what I feel like doing. You know, it's not about this life, is it? It's about eternal life. Knowing what God wants, coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Think about the Ten Commandments. Yes, we can look at them because there's a lot of don'ts there. Actually, you can make a don't out of every one of them. Let me just go through them real quick with you. And uh, uh, just just to say, say it in, in another way, um, the way that the world looks at them. Number one, don't have other gods. Two, don't make graven images. Three, don't take his name in vain. Four, uh, don't forget the Sabbath day. Five, don't dishonor thy father and thy mother. Six, don't kill or don't murder. Seven, don't commit adultery. Eight, don't steal. Nine, don't lie. And ten, don't covet. <laughs> A lot of don'ts, huh? But, you know, if we recognize what those don'ts are, God is telling us, stop thinking about yourself. Think about others. Think about your relationship with God. The first ones, uh, no other gods, no graven images, don't take his name in vain, and the Sabbath day are our relationship with God. Four, four I got it. Now the rest of, them, rest of them are about our relationship with other people. God wants us to have a proper relationship with others. And any, any of these, really, each one of those um, six about other people, each of them, we talked about stealing this morning in Sunday school. Each of those, if we fail and we, and we do kill or we do commit adultery, we do steal, or we do lie, or we do covet, we are stealing from our fellow man one way or another. We're taking their, uh, we're being, we're mistreating them. We're being selfish again. So an abundant life, the life that God wants us to have, is a joy-filled life uh, with Christ at the center and reaching out to others and remembering others, not being selfish about only about ourselves. But what about ourselves? We had a friend, Damon Koval, used to go to church here, and uh, he said the... Uh, the only selfish thing you should do is to accept Christ because that's for you. You can't accept Christ for anybody else. But we need Jesus Christ. And yes, we are to live for ourselves to a certain extent. Not taking from other people, but living our life the way God wants us to live. Following Him, doing as He says benefits us. And so if we're going to be selfish, be selfish in our relationship with Christ. Work at our relationship with Christ. Now go back to uh, 2 Corinthians and see what Paul says. Um, and as he, remember what he said, he was living for others, but he had to go through these things. This is his responsibility and his part of life that God gave him. Look at verse number uh, 8. He says, we are troubled. We are troubled. Troubled means to be uh, compressed or pressed down upon. We're troubled, but we're um, on every side, yet not distressed. Okay, you ever have trouble? That's what we talked about this morning. You could be, be discouraged, or you could be down, downtrodden, and you don't know what to do. He says, no, we're not distressed. 
He says, we are perplexed. He says, I don't know what's going to happen the next day. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. You know, he's, he's, he's working on his relationship with Christ. He says, I'm trusting Christ. I'm, I, I recognize God is watching over me. And okay, so I'm troubled and I'm perplexed. But I still know God's in control. I still look to him. He says, I'm persecuted, but I know God's still with me. I'm not forsaken. Uh, I'm cast down. Remember what the Old Testament says? Uh, the steps of, uh, is that the one? Ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Uh, though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down. Why? Because the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So he says, I'm, I'm, I'm cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might, look at this, might be made manifest in our body. I go through these things because it's God's plan for me. And I keep looking to him so that as I go through this trouble, people see Christ in me. We are to show Christ in others. We shouldn't be forsaken, feels forsaken. We should not feel destroyed. Psalm 4, 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Christ is there. So we live for him through our lives. Yes, we do think about ourselves and we have to deal with things. It's wrong to be self-centered, but God does focus on you and me. The song we sang, I think it was this morning, His Eyes on the Sparrow, is talking about God looking down and seeing us and, and saying, listen, you are of more value than any sparrow. God knows the number of hairs on your head. And it's easier for some. It's not easier for God to count your hairs. It's all the same. He knows you and he knows that you are important. He does focus on you. This Bible is for whom? It's for us. He didn't have it put together for uh, donkeys and oxen. He put it together for people because he cares about us. We can have joy as we recognize that God loves us. John 16, 24 says, Hitherto, Jesus is saying, Hitherto, up to this point, have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye re shall receive, that your joy may be full. John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. When you look at those things that I mentioned, Jesus number one, and then look toward others, number two, and then, then think about yourself. J-O-Y. You've probably seen that. Jesus, others, and you. Uh, that's the way to have an abundant life, a joy-filled, abundant life, what God wants each of us to have, not to, not to be in despair, not to be despondent, but always having joy. You know, we can have troubles and we will but we are to never lose the joy because God doesn't have a lack of joy and he wants you to be mature enough to see through the troubles and to recognize you can have joy because Christ is in your life a joy filled life abundant life that Christ came to give us Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that you desire for us to have joy. You desire that we get to know you and, and uh, uh, grow in you, recognize that you're in our lives. We have a responsibility that you have given to us to go into all nations preaching the gospel and Lord, you give us a responsibility to be the people you want us to be. To put into practice those things that 
show that we are Christians so that the world sees Christ in us. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ coming to give us an abundant, joy-filled life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.